Kid Ham, we might look at uh, uh, askance. Uh, he's not a uh, scholar, uh, very much a populist, and uh, has a big business doing this. Uh, but let's look at somebody else, uh, very respectable scholar, uh, Philip Johnson, who makes claims, although in more philosophical and less cartoonish garb, that are very similar. Evolution, says Philip Johnson, is promoted to persuade the public to believe that there is no purposeful intelligence that transcends the natural world. Now this is very different than saying evolution is the central organizing principle of the field of biology because it coordinates a mountain of data. That's how biologists, and I suspect the biologists at Calvin would describe evolutionary theory. Johnson says, no, that's not where we get evolution. The purpose of evolution is to convince people that there is no point to our existence, no God, nothing that transcends human existence, and so we can just live on our own however we please. Now, is there any hope of rehabilitating evolution? Uh, here's Howard that uh, spent his career here at uh, uh, Calvin. Uh, he tried to introduce a new word. My guess is that you've never heard the word that he tried to introduce because he wasn't successful uh, with that. He wanted to stop talking about the world as being produced by evolution and use instead the phrase a fully gifted creation, that God endowed the creation with all the resources that it needs to accomplish his purposes. In this book called Three Views on Creation and Evolution in which Van Til dialogued with some people who held different ideas, he couldn't even get the people who were dialoguing with him to use this word. Uh, and so much of his writing in here was fussing about why they wouldn't call uh, the world a fully gifted creation uh, instead of using the term evolution. Uh, Francis Collins in his book The Language of God uh, coined the term uh, biologos. Uh, I'm involved in a project that Francis started, and if you go to our website, uh, biologos.org, you can see some uh, discussion of this uh, topic. Uh, we are hoping that by being able to use this word biologos, which is obscure and geeky sounding, so nobody really knows what it means, uh, that if you don't know what it means, at least you don't think it means something bad. Uh, so this maybe gives us a way to kind of talk about uh, evolutionary ideas uh, and sneak them in the rhetorical back door before anybody realizes uh, exactly what we've done. Uh, so anyway, you can go to biologos.org if you want to see what you think of, uh, of this strategy. Now, now, the problem though, I think, with... Uh, I mean, let's take, let's take Philip Johnson, for example. Philip Johnson is a brilliant lawyer, very, very smart guy. And he got inspired to launch the intelligent design movement when he read a book by Richard Dawkins, the blind watchmaker. Johnson is in uh, London on a sabbatical and he buys a book in a bookstore and he reads it and he uh, gets really, really upset. Now, Johnson was entirely reasonable in his response to Dawkins. What Dawkins tries to argue in the, in the blind watchmaker is not really philosophically defensible. I mean, he makes a kind of a caricatured case that evolution rules out the possibility of there being any purpose to human existence. And Johnson, as a very clever lawyer, skilled with all the tools of rhetorical analysis, could see through what Dawkins was doing. But the problem is, if anyone from outside the scientific community, any random person, a lawyer or a lay person, anyone, uh, wanders into a bookstore and says, well, I would like to read some books about contemporary science, uh, show me where the science section is. If you go to the science section and you simply purchase the books that are there and read them, you're going to get exactly the same impression that Philip Johnson got. And this is a very, very serious problem for science communication in this country. In uh, the book that I published with Mariano Artigas a couple of years ago, we, we looked at this in a little bit of detail and, and it's really quite disturbing. Uh, we identified what we think are the six most influential, <coughs> excuse me, influential public figures that represent science in the English-speaking world. So people that you would see on public television, on bestseller lists, interviewed on NPR, uh, and so on. We call these guys the oracles of science. The six individuals are Richard Dawkins, uh, who we've already met, uh, Stephen Hawking uh, with his extraordinary bestseller 
uh, A Brief History of Time. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, the Harvard paleontologist and uh, great essayist. Uh, E.O. Wilson won two Pulitzer Prizes, uh, ranked by Time Magazine as one of the most influential people of the 20th century. Uh, Steven Weinberg, who, who wrote the first uh, three minutes, has a Nobel Prize uh, in physics. And, uh, and Carl Sagan. Now, you can argue with this list, but most people would concede that uh, certainly these would be uh, candidates, uh, if not the top six, certainly near the top. Every single one of these six individuals is hostile to religion in some way. The only one of these six that has any faint tinge of religion to him uh, is E.O. Wilson, who concedes that, that maybe in the back of his mind he could be a deist. He thinks the laws of physics are quite remarkable, uh, and he wonders if you don't need a cosmic mind to get the universe started. Uh, but other than that, there's no place uh, for God. Uh, Dawkins and Weinberg think that religion is evil and sinister. Not merely false, but evil and sinister. Uh, Weinberg, in a very nasty review of a John Polkinghorne book, made the statement uh, that if you see a good person doing evil, you can be sure that it's because they are religious. Right? Extraordinary claim. Uh, so these guys as a whole are absolutely unfriendly to faith, and yet they are the public figures. This is a disastrous public relations problem for science in the English-speaking world that its major public figures are so insensitive to religious sensibilities. Uh, Francis Collins is emerging as perhaps an exception. And maybe uh, if a book like this is written 10 years from now, maybe he would be on this list as a public figure. But when we're talking about public figures, we mean characters of such notoriety that they might actually get onto South Park or The Simpsons or something like that. I mean, I mean uh, Stephen Hawking has been on The Simpsons two or three times. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould was on there. Uh, there was a whole episode of South Park about uh, Richard Dawkins and so on. I mean, these, these are huge cultural uh, figures. Now, because of this complexity between trying to distill what is science from what is science as a worldview being used to bash religion, I think that we have to understand that we are not in a conversation about what's the best scientific description of natural history. This instead is a culture war. Evolution has become a part of the culture wars, up there with gay marriage and abortion and uh, now universal health care and so on. And you take it, I mean, where you just have polarized sides that just want to win. And they don't really care whether what they're saying is completely accurate or not. Uh, in Species of Origins, Don Yerkes and I lay out this case that, that America's search for a creation story is really now just a, uh, a culture war about who gets to tell the story of how humanity came to be. And you can see this, here's a, sort of a quick summary by looking at bumper stickers, but I think most of you have probably seen these bumper stickers, but here's the famous uh, Jesus fish, uh, but then the Darwin fish comes along and challenges. The Jesus fish evolves, and grows legs and so on, and turns into the Darwin fish. Uh, but then we can challenge the Darwin fish and have the truth fish come along and eat, gobble up the Darwin fish, <laughs> if you want. Uh, or the Darwin fish can eat the Jesus fish. Uh, I mean, again, these are just the dueling uh, bumper stickers. And then there's this one here, which I don't really know uh, <laughs> exactly what that one is, but <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have that on at, at Calvin College. I'll cover that up. <laughs> so so in, in navigating this complicated, this complicated world, that we're in where we want to try to talk about evolution, this, this is how the conversation is occurring out there. I mean, this, this is kind of what we're up against, so that you, you can't even use this word. You can't say Darwinism out there and have people think of it in any narrow, restrictive sense as a purely scientific theory. It's a big worldview and a part of the culture wars. It's a big, nasty word. Uh, so we don't even have an adequate vocabulary to deal with this. So this, this is the reason why this project was launched with uh, with Francis Collins, and there's countless other projects, and uh, Calvin faculty have taken a lot of leadership on this question, so on. But it's a big, nasty problem within American evangelicalism to be able to th somehow think about how we are going to make peace with Darwin's theory uh, when so many people see it uh, in this way. Uh, 
For me, though, 